All right. Good evening again, everyone, and a special good evening to our very special guest, Jason Jones. You know, this is Pride TT 2020, and the name, the year, we actually deliberately played on it. It's Pride 20, because it's the year 2020, but it's also Pride 20 slash 2.0, because what we are trying to do this year, and Jason intimated and referred to it earlier before we started the conversation, that especially with COVID-19, it has given us an opportunity to look at Pride in a different way and reflect. And we wanted in Trinidad and Tobago to take Pride to the next level, version 2.0, and to utilize technology in a different way to put emphasis and focus on what Pride should be focused on, as opposed to just the placards, protests, and parades, and parties. Those things have a space, and they are important, and they have value, but we need to reflect and focus on intersectional issues. We need to reflect on the dynamics within the community that need to be worked out so that we can come together better and understand each other. And we need to have moments like this where we can have conversation with persons in our community who are blazing trails and document those moments. Because sometimes in the heat of pride itself, we of course get caught up in all of the other public activities and we sometimes lose focus on these precious moments that are important for our history and our younger generations to come afterwards. So that is what Pride TT 20 2.0 is all about. For those of you who would have seen our graphics and our artwork, that's the context and the messaging that we're pushing. And this year, especially as Trinidad and Tobago is in an election season and the general election is upon us, we wanted to also use Pride as a platform to work with our community and other marginalized groups to develop mobilization and power. And that's where, where the, the theme came from, be empowered by our pride. So we thought as a committee, of what would make sense and have value to persons during this pride. And we are focused on mental, financial, and political empowerment, and all the other forms of empowerment that would come as a result of that. Uh, and that's why, again, the theme is be empowered by our pride. And tonight's live chat is the first of nearly 20 live chats that we will be hosting this month, this season, for Pride TT 20 2.0. And while we celebrated the launch on Friday at the Parliament, as we normally do, and again, not just because Jason's on the call tonight, but it's important to recognize that that is also our way of commemorating his activism in Trinidad and Tobago and his, his work that really mobilized the greatest showing in recent times outside the parliament in 2018 with the Stand With Us movement. So every year we pay homage to that movement and his activism by launching Pride outside the parliament. And especially this year, as I said, it's a, an election year reminding the MPs that queer votes count. And if they would like the marginal, marginalized votes uh, in ironically the marginalized seats, then they have to come forward and genuinely represent our concerns and our interests. And while we celebrated on Friday at the parliament and followed it up with a nationwide flag raising ceremony, uh, and I must say we have some members on the call from Tobago and I will introduce a few persons before I introduce Jason, uh, but we do have people from the, the sister aisle Tobago actually had, I think, the largest flag raising of all five this year. Uh, they put people in Trinidad to shame, and we recognize that, but it shows that the Pride TT movement is growing, and we really want to acknowledge that. So Saturday was our flag raising in six different locations across the country, 
And yesterday, we actually, as, and I always remember that pride is not new. Pride has been celebrated in Trinidad and Tobago for over 30 years. Jason can attest to that, and we'll get into that um, in a little bit as we talk with him. But pride in its current incarnation, of course, started in 2018. But pride always started, whether now or in the past, with Pride Memorial. And on Sunday, we took the opportunity to look at Memorial slightly differently. And we memorialized none other than Sasha Faith our trans sister whom, whom we lost in a very tragic circumstance uh, a couple of years ago. And as some of you know, we have the Pride Fair and Parade at Nelson Mandela Park in her honor. And we partnered with the Trans Coalition of Trinidad and Tobago to host the launch of the Sasha Faith Memorial Fund. And that fund will actually raise money to have direct community intervention in the trans community and assist them with career development and skills development. So that's what has happened in the last three days. But tonight is the first of the live chat series. And it is themed, Know Your Legal Rights. And we thought that because we were focused on political empowerment in particular, as well as financial and mental empowerment, the law has a lot of impact on those issues and how we feel and how empowered we actually are. And we thought no one else would be the best person than Jason Jones to speak to these issues tonight. And I'm going to just pause to introduce some, some uh, members of the committee and then introduce Jason and we can get right into the conversation. So I see tonight we have members of our Pride TT Management Committee, such as Ava Chavez, who recently joined the Board of Directors. She's also the current head of Women's Caucus, and she is our community liaison lead this year. We have Faye Ferdinandus on the call, um, well-known activist and founder of several groups. I know she was one of the founding members of Lambda. The younger people in the room may not know what that is, but we will be speaking about those matters in subsequent talks. We have Giselle Shipley, who is right now the interim co-lead of the Tobago Pride Group. We have Kennedy Mirage, who is another director of Pride TT, and he is this year heading up the motorcade because we are, we are moving away from the parade as Jason mentioned before the call started and really trying to take pride throughout the country into the rural communities and you will be hearing more about that. We have Micah Clark, uh, Epiphany Jack and Shahan who are members of Pride UE and I believe some of their other members on the team and Pride UE sits on the Pride Management Committee as well. I see we have Sean Gobin Singh from Pride, South Pride and Allies, another offshoot group of Pride TT, Sohan Badal, and we have Zoe Sazo, uh, who has also joined us this year. I may be skipping a few people because the call list has grown much longer, um, but if uh, during the call, you would like to contribute during the Q&A session, feel free to introduce yourself and let us know a little bit about you, again, if you feel comfortable to do so. So with all of those niceties being said, Jason Jones. Jason Jones is an LGBT human rights defender, originally from Trinidad and Tobago. His activism in LGBTQ plus human rights spans three decades, 33 years to be exact. In 1992, he was on the board of the first LGBTQ plus organization in Trinidad and Tobago and the Southern Caribbean. And I mentioned it earlier, that was indeed the Lambda Group. And maybe Jason will share a little bit about that with us tonight as we get into the conversation. He is, of course, also the co-founder of TNT LGBTQ plus organization, I Am One. 
And actually, I am one, I must take this opportunity to thank them. The very first year we had pride in this fashion, I am one allowed pride to leverage its brand, TT Pride Arts Festival, and that was the banner under which we hosted the first public pride. And I am one remains one of our partners to today, and actually Zelika Julian uh, is on our live chat tomorrow along with other persons, but I'll get into that afterwards. In 1996, he joined the board of the Stonewall Immigration Group, now known as the United Kingdom Lesbian and Gay Immigration Group which won the right of abode in the UK for the overseas partner of an LGBT UK citizen. He and his then partner from Trinidad were one of 40 test cases at the Home Office, which brought about this landmark win for British LGBT people. The first pro-LGBT legislation in the UK post decriminalization. He is the only person in history who has helped change the laws in two countries for the betterment of LGBTQ persons. On April 12th, 2018, as you all would remember, I am sure, he won a landmark legal challenge at the High Court of Trinidad and Tobago, which decriminalized adult consensual same-sex intimacy. His victory was used in the decriminalization victory of India, freeing some 75 million LGBT Indian people. His landmark victory has been appealed by the government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago and will be heard at the Privy Council in London in due course. His victory there will lead to decriminalization across the Caribbean. He was nominated for the UK National Diversity Award for LGBT and also nominated for the Pink News Campaigner of the Year 2019. He received the 2018 Attitude Pride Award and the inaugural Gay Star News Founders Award in recognition of the three decades of work and achievements for the LGBTQ plus community. And I know that sometimes we listen to these, these bios and we think, is it important to know all of this about somebody? And if even only for this documentation on this call, this recording, it is important, I think, that we recognize Jason and all of his achievements. And I'm sure there will be many more to come. So Jason, uh, I'm just asking people to remember to mute themselves. But let me get right into it. On that note, Jason, we, we can read the bio and we can read about all of these achievements, but I have known you for a long time. And there is a Jason Jones that some people may not know. And I thought I would start by spending a few minutes asking you to talk a little bit about the younger Jason Jones, the Jason Jones that grew up in Trinidad and Tobago uh, in, 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 a, in circumstances that sometimes people may not acknowledge or believe because they sometimes look at your achievements and look at you and don't know your history. And I thought I'd let you start a little bit about share, with sharing a bit about you in that regard. Great. Um, thank you for that wonderful introduction, Rudy, and a uh, very warm greetings to everybody this evening who's watching. Um, I'm very, very honored to be here, and uh, tonight is my first uh, participatory event with Pride TT, and I'm very honored to have been asked to do this. Um, in terms of uh, my history, I think that there has been a narrative that has been uh, pervasive that uh, I'm not quite Trinidadian enough or I'm not quite black enough or I'm not quite gay enough. I don't know what's going on, but um, you know, I went to, uh, I, I was born in Woodbrook and I grew up in Woodbrook. I went to Newtown Boys RC School uh, until 1976. 
Um, at that time, I was a music festival champion. I'm a singer. And uh, I then went on to pass common entrance with a national scholarship to Fatima College. And I attended Fatima College from 1976 until 1981. During those years, I uh, pursued my, my, my passion, which was uh, really singing and performing. And I was a member of the Goretti Group and I and La Petite Musicale. I don't know if anybody remembers them. I don't even know if they're still running. Um, these were two very important uh, choirs in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, the La Petite Musicale is, was the most important uh, folk choir in Trinidad. So I have a very large repertoire of folk songs of Trinidad and Tobago and our history in music. And the Goretti Group was a semi-apostolic uh, uh, choir run by the amazing Maria Alonso. What I learned from Maria Alonso is uh, phenomenal. She taught me so much about how to present and how to stand before an audience. And you know, the things that Maria and Helen Camps of Tent Theatre taught me has been hugely impactful for me as an advocate. Um, I spoke uh, last year in both houses of parliament in the United Kingdom. The, uh, I spoke in uh, the um, chamber at um, an event hosted by Diane Abbott, uh, front bencher of the Labour Party. And then later in the year, I spoke in the House of Lords as the guest of Lord Smith. And uh, when you are standing before such a hollow, hallowed uh, space, uh, Things like what Maria taught me and what Helen taught me uh, were hugely important uh, to face uh, that audience. So after leaving Fatima, I then joined uh, Trinidad Tent Theatre, which was run by Helen Camps. And at the time, Trinidad the Tent Theatre was the first um, local uh, theatre company that was training people um, in the theater arts. So I was trained in art, uh, I was trained in theater, I was trained in drama and dance. I used to do ballet at the Caribbean School of Dance in Dare Street with the fantastic Pat Rowe. Um, at that point, I met the amazing uh, Nolan Frederick, who sadly passed on April 25th this year. Um, the theater community was very central in my development. And at that time, as a 18 year old, um, not knowing what gay was, the theater community was where I found my gay community as well. And we were a very close-knit close -knit community. Uh, people like Raymond Chu Kong, who, you know, I, I, I think uh, many of you will have read uh, my statements about his murder. Raymond, I know since I was 18, we were incredibly close friends right up until the moment of, of his passing or his taking. He didn't pass, he was taken from us. And uh, all of these amazing LGBT people who were in the fashion industry, I used to model for mailing. I, I modeled the first ever fashion show by The Cloth. I, I modeled for Robert Young there. Uh, so all of these arts industries were populated and pretty much run and uh, the LGBT community were so central in these, in these different areas. Uh, Minchel, you know, I, I, I was one of the people with Ronald Guy James that choreographed and staged the opening of Minchel's now, in, now famous trilogy of um, The River, and the Golden Calabash, so Kalalu in between. Um, you know, these were all things that had a huge impact on me and the LGBT community at the time, leading up until the HIV AIDS crisis was incredibly vibrant, incredibly moving the, the national uh, discourse forward on our culture, it was uh, a renaissance in Trinidad and Tobago at that time. And then of course, HIV AIDS hit. Um, I don't think many of you know this, but in Trinidad and Tobago, we had the second highest 
mortality rate from HIV AIDS in the world. We were second per capita only to New York City. So between 1982 and 1992, we lost dozens upon dozens upon dozens of the most amazing gay men. Uh, people like Godfrey Seeley, Jeffrey Stanford, John Isaacs, uh, Froggy, Andre Froge, um, the list goes on and on and on. And, uh, you know, it, it was a very dark period of our history. And I'm very lucky to have survived it. Uh, very few of us have survived, you know, Uncle Cyrus Sylvester, who, I, who all of you, I'm sure, are very uh, familiar with. Um, whenever we meet, there's always this very dark cloud that hangs over us in our meetings, thinking about the people that we've lost. Um, it left a very big hole for us at that time and continues to be a dark cloud today. So for me, when I finally uh, left the Trinidad and Tobago shores, having, having done the first um, uh, drag show in a public theater space, uh, again, I think people don't know this, but the space theater um, was a theater space created by Raymond Chu Kong in uh, Victoria Avenue in the Breton Hall. And uh, I had done a drag show at a secret party at Stacey Wells's house. Stacey Wells was a very famous uh, artist um, who also very sadly passed away from HIV AIDS. Um, I performed with Godfrey Seeley and Gregory Singh um, in a show at Stacy's uh, house for a gay party. And uh, <laughs> um, Debbie Maillard came up to me and she said, you need to do a full show. You need to do a big thing. You know, let's do a big thing. Let's go to, to Raymond and do a full show of Mercedes Growl. My drag character's name was Mercedes Growl. And in uh, summer of 1992, I did the first ever public um, open to the public drag performance. It was a two hour long show <laughs> featuring yours truly as Mercedes Growl. And Mercedes told her story using song and dance and Godfrey was another character and Gurgi Singh performed. And um, it was uh, uh, one of those landmark moments in, in Trinidad queer society where we stepped out of the shadows. Um, unfortunately, also in the audience, the show happened over two nights on a weekend. The show was held at midnight because Raymond had a show running uh, uh, concurrently. So we performed on, not on the stage, but just on the floor below the stage. So we didn't disturb their show and we performed the show at midnight. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> at the show were two reporters from uh, the uh, press uh, one from the Sunday Punch and one from the Daily Mirror. And uh, the next week, those, those were weekly newspapers. They would come out at, on Thursdays. So the next Thursday, um, I was staying at my stepmother's house in St. James. And they knew that I had done a theater show. They had no idea what the show was. They just knew I was, you know, acting in something. Anyway, I got a phone call from Debbie and she says, uh, okay, you need to see the press, go and buy a newspaper. So I walked around the corner to the corner shop and there across all of the front pages of the red tops in bright red letters, Homo holds concert in City Theatre. Well, I uh, sat on, a, on the pavement reading this thing. I'm thinking, well, once this hits, that's it, I'm done. And by the time I got back home, I called up my friend Annabelle, we went to Smokey and Bunties and drank and then waited up the, 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 the Dutch courage to go home. And by the time I reached back, uh, my bags were packed on the front steps. And I walked up the steps and they said, you have brought shame and disgrace to the family name, get out. So I was made homeless. And at that point, um, I realized that uh, I needed to get out. And, you know, my mother is English, so I have dual citizenship. So I jumped on a plane, a one-way ticket, and escaped. So my history in Trinidad is <laughs> quite long, uh, quite convoluted. 
And, uh, you know, I've done, when, when I came to London, I became very incentivized uh, by LGBT human rights. In 1988, a law was passed by the then Prime Minister of the Conservative-led government, uh, Margaret Thatcher, called Section 28. And Section 28 was a law that said no public money, no public uh, 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 funded agency could promote homosexuality. So that meant libraries could not have books. That meant teachers could not say the word homosexual. There was a complete blackout on homosexuality if you had any access to government funding. Um, so at that point, uh, a group of uh, gay people came together, LGBT people came together and started marching um, in front of parliament uh, against this law, the, the, the clause 28, section 28 marches. At that point, I was a student here in, in London and uh, most of the students, there was not an LGBT uh, element in the student body. So I then created it and got people involved in going on the marches. And I was arrested twice on the marches. Um, the police would pile us into the back of their wagons, drive us you know, a mile down the road and then release us because we were too many to be arrested and charged. At that point, I really thought long and hard about what my place was as an LGBT person. And, you know, to escape the homophobia that I had experienced in Trinidad and to now meet it here in what was supposed to be an advanced first world nation, it really kind of lit the fire for me to start fighting back. And I became very involved with uh, the LGBT movement here in the UK. And at the same time, there was the anti-apartheid movement that was very powerful here in the UK as well. And for me as a, as a queer person of color, there was an intersectionality of the two things. So um, I was very much a part of that movement of intersectionality between the anti-apartheid movement and the LGBTQ plus movement. Um, I then, uh, after uh, some years in, uh, traveling around nomadically around Europe, um, in 1992, I came back to Trinidad, um, ostensibly just on a holiday. I came for carnival. And the day of my flight, I was hanging out with my two friends and, you know, bag packed. And we stopped off for a drink. And I said, you know what? I'm not going to go back. I, 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 I'm going to hang out here for a while. And in 1992, um, we did the show at Space Theatre. And then coming out of the show, there were these conversations about us being more proactive and creating an organization. And this was what blossomed as what um, we call the Lambda Group. I think Faye is here. Faye, if you want to jump in here, that'd be fine. But the Lambda Group used to meet in the basement of the Space Theater, the Space Bar, which was in the basement. We used to meet every Saturday. And the leadership was very, um, uh, we had a very beautiful leadership that had uh, lesbians and gay men, HIV positive people. You know, it was such a, a, an incredible time for LGBT rights in Trinidad and Tobago. And of course, this was the first LGBT organization, not just in Trinidad and, and Tobago, but the entire southern uh, region of the Caribbean. So we met uh, quite uh, frequently every Saturday, created a board started working on uh, advocacy and programming. And then unfortunately, um, over 50% of our, uh, our board uh, passed away from HIV AIDS. Uh, people like Godfrey, people like Jeffrey Stanford, John Isaacs, um, Froggy, you know, we, we just, uh, it, it, it was a huge stumbling block losing these powerful voices. And Lambda just kind of frittered away because of it. Um, I then met my now ex-partner and my mother passed away. And I said to him, well, listen, you know, mom, I'm half English and I, if you want, we can go up to London and spend two years. At that point, they had what was called a young person's Commonwealth visa that allowed 
Trinidad and Tobago citizens two years, um, Trinidad and Tobago citizens under the age of 28 to go back to the United Kingdom to visit the mother country. So I said, well, we can go and do the two years and then come back home to Trinidad. And he said, great. After a year of living in London, uh, he was very adamant that he didn't want to return to Trinidad. Um, we had been together for two years in Trinidad. And, you know, you in London, it was a totally different experience for our relationship. Our relationship was respected and honored and we could, you know, walk in certain spaces, certain safe spaces, holding hands. We could show intimacy in public. You know, it, it was a very different experience for our relationship. So he said, listen, I don't want to go back. So I said, well, if you find a way for you to stay, then fine. But I don't know any way for you, for, for you to stay. So he, he did all the research and he found this organization called the Stonewall Immigration Group. Um, they are now called the United Kingdom Lesbian and Gay Immigration Group. And we went to meetings and it sounded very positive what they were saying. So I approached the leadership to say, you know, what can I do? How can I get more involved? And they said, well, we, we need people on the board. We need people, I, I work in sales and marketing and you know, we need people with your experience who can do stuff around our, our messaging and fundraising. So I went onto the board as uh, their fundraising and messaging person. And I also volunteered uh, one day a week where I would answer the phones for people calling in to say, oh, well, me and my partner are being split up. You know, what can you do to help us? So after lobbying the then um, Labour Party who were in opposition, the head of um, UKLGIG, Mark Watson, he did an incredible job of political lobbying and he made a promise to the Labour government in opposition that if they passed a law allowing the uh, right of abode to the overseas partner of a British subject, then we would vote for them. Now, this was not a huge shift because that law already existed for straight couples. You did not have to be married as a straight couple, you, you could get the right of abode based on four years cohabitation, or maybe two years cohabitation, either two or four years. My, my memory is it's a long time ago. And, um, and in 1997, as Labour swept to power in a landslide victory, um, they kept their promise. And three months later, the law was changed. Uh, my partner and I, my then partner and I, were one of the 40 test cases that were challenging this, this, this amendment for a year and a half. We were, both of our passports were seized. We were not allowed to travel. Um, and every month we would get a letter from the Home Office saying that he is about to be forcibly evicted from the country. So it was a very traumatic um, way of getting uh, power for the LGBT community, but we did it. And um, I then, after, after that all happened and he got his British uh, residency, eventually his British passport, we then started, you know, traveling around a bit more in the world. We lived in Australia. We, we, I, I spent time in, in uh, uh, Indonesia. And after our relationship broke down, I thought to myself, well, you know, I've been able to achieve this for the United Kingdom. Um, what can I do for Trinidad and Tobago? And I, after a nine year gap of not visiting Trinidad because of uh, the very awful homophobia that I had experienced from my family, um, I got a call, phone call pretty much out of the blue a gay man uh, named Peter um, Segobin. God, it's so emotional to bring him this stuff up. I haven't talked about this stuff in a long time. Um, Peter, Peter Segobin was my brother's best friend when he was a teenager. And then when Peter came out of the closet, um, he then became my very close friend. So Peter unfortunately passed away from HIV AIDS and my brother reached out to me to say that Peter had passed. And in the conversation, he said, you know, Jay, I have four children and they're all asking about this mysterious uncle. 
that they know nothing about. Um, you know, they want to know who you are. And I said, well, you know, Jeremy, if you want me to come home, I can jump on a flight. You know, it's not a big deal. But, you know, I, I have no reason to come home. If you give me a reason to come home, I'll come home. So in 2009, after a nine-year gap, I came home. And in that trip, I met many of my old LGBT buddies. Um, and what was quite shocking to me was that uh, nothing had advanced in Trinidad and Tobago regarding LGBT rights. And of course, here was I having changed the law in, in the UK. So I decided to return home. And in 2011, I, I moved back home. Um, in, two, in 2010, I returned back home. And in, in 2011, um, the CNC3 did a program on television, an in-depth report on LGBT. Uh, you can look at, at the in-depth report on YouTube. It's available on YouTube. And they did three nights on LGBT, and it was just vile. It was riddled with homophobia. It was riddled with the, the most awful things being said about us. And the people that, they were be, that were being interviewed on behalf of the LGBT community were just not who the majority of us are. They were picking the most dramatic and overly uh, camp and overly uh, uh, distra distractive personalities. And I wrote a very strongly worded letter to the press, which went viral. They didn't have the term viral back then, but it went viral. And uh, we got the right of reply from CNC3. They reached out to me and said, you know, we're going to do an extra report and you will be able to reply. So I put a call out to the community saying, you know, we're looking for people for this right of reply. And um, two people that stood out were Craig Rodriguez Sejas and Siobhan Vera. And you can also see this right of reply. But what was interesting also with that uh, uh, program was I got a phone call from someone just before the filming saying that the producer of this, of this homophobic uh, uh, documentary was a reformed lesbian who was born again Christian and was putting Bibles on people's car windscreens in front of gay parties. So before we started filming, I challenged her to say, is this true? Are you a reformed lesbian? Are you born again Christian? Are you putting Bibles on people's cars? Um, she screamed very loudly and uh, ran out of the room and the team at CNC3 then, and the head of the news department uh, then banned her from any further involvement with the program. So we were allowed our right of reply. After that, uh, I really felt very strongly that we needed an organization that was looking at our media um, uh, face. I don't think that uh, people are really aware of how important it is for us as a community to have a strong, vibrant, vocal, um, and eloquent voice in the media. So I and Siobhan and Craig then co-founded I Am One. After that, in 2014, um, through very personal uh, uh, issues, I had to return to London. And uh, when I returned to London, uh, the Kaleidoscope Trust, which is a UK-based organization that looks at LGBT rights internationally, um, we had had discussions about the possibility of creating a Commonwealth network of LGBT organizations. What is interesting about the history of homophobia is that over three, over 50% of the countries that criminalize uh, homosexuality are countries that were former colonies of Britain. British colonial uh, laws are what we are fighting. These laws were spread by Britain across her colonies. And of course, Britain's colonies, uh, are, they cover over three quarters of the planet, from India to the Caribbean and across Africa and Southeast Asia. So I then got involved with Kaleidoscope Trust and I was one of the uh, founders in developing the Commonwealth Equality Network. 
The Commonwealth Equality Network now has, I think, about 37 member organizations, um, or maybe I might have the numbers wrong, but they have a number of member of organ LGBT organizations from across the Commonwealth. And in 2015, we held the first um, uh, LGBT uh, summit in the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting at the People's Forum. This was the first time ever in history. And then uh, two years later, the Commonwealth Equality Network was the first LGBT organization to receive Commonwealth accreditation. At uh, that time, I came back from Malta at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting and I had never sat in these kinds of rooms. It's not, it's not anything that interests me. I, I, I don't get a great deal out of that kind of level of engagement. And on the plane back from Malta in 2015, I said to myself, I needed to do something much more visceral, much more active. And I reached out to lawyers to discuss the possibility of challenging the discriminatory laws in Trinidad and Tobago. We had many, many meetings and I, after six months of work, we formulated our strategy. I engaged the uh, legal representation that you are all aware of. I had Rishi Das and Antonio Emanuel from Trinidad and Tobago in the Victoria Chambers. Um, Peter Lavrak is the uh, designer and strategic lead, um, and also Richard Drabble QC um, is my lead counsel, and my solicitors are Paul Hastings. Uh, Paul Hastings is a huge global billion dollar law firm. Uh, this case going Jason, into it. Jason, let me just yes. jump in for a moment. So stick a pin. Yes. Because we have, we have time but I want to, I don't want some of what you said before we get into the case itself. I think this is a nice point to just let it okay. consume me in some people's minds. A yes. lot of what you said that is not necessarily known history. Uh, yes. I think okay. it's important for people to recognize that nothing in life is really coincidental. If they follow your trajectory, Everything from your schooling to your, uh, as you yourself said, your training in the theater, all of these things make someone who and what they are. And it doesn't make people perfect, but it gives you skills that you can then apply in your work. And people like, I mean, I was also uh, really humbled uh, to, to have learned from God, people like Godfrey Seely, myself, Cyrus Sylvester. I mean, I started my activism at 15 with Danny James, another person who we lost as well. And the scourge of HIV AIDS in of itself, I think a lot of people who are younger than I am, they, I was on the band of it but you all saw firsthand what uh, like anthony medina he shows me his his albums and there are close to 100 people in those albums that are no longer with us and i remember when we had to go and care for these people in hospices and at their homes when no one even the health institutions did not want to treat with them and those kinds of memories must leave, as I think you, inter, you did intimate about it, the trauma, the, 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 the trauma that you face, not only in your family, but in all the other spheres of life, that sometimes, it, it, for some people, it can diminish them. But you were able to find a way to harness that. And I wanted you to talk a little bit more about that process before we got into the case itself. So that again, the younger activists and anyone on the call can really get a sense, how were you able to process all of that and funnel it into such public and strong activism? 
yeah okay i i get you thank you thank you for your timely in, interjection because i <laughs> i do ramble on and i talk very quickly um i i think you know for 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 me um it was a matter of survival you know when you are when you are in a situation where you know people are dying around you friends lovers you know colleagues it was a, a very clear case of a matter of just being alive and being so so very grateful that i was alive and that i was able to be the voice for people who had their voices taken from them so awfully you know i don't think people as you rightly said have any concept of what that period was like it was so bad that uh people were afraid to go to gay parties because uh the rumor was that it was passed on by mosquitoes it was so bad that uh i um Uh, my stepmother, my 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 brother's wife, um, uh, said that she didn't want that AIDS riddle bulla around her two sons. And I have not spoken to my two nephews since two thousand and nine because of that. The stigma around HIV/AIDS at that time in Trinidad and Tobago and across the world, but particularly in Trinidad and Tobago, because we were such a so small society and so badly hit by it um, was incredible. You know, people would not accept food from you. You know, you could not get a job. You could not, you know, I remember this very beautiful man, uh, Charles Guillaume, who used to do the windows of all the major stores in Frederick Street. This was when downtown Port of Spain was the it place. There weren't malls at that time. This was it. And Frederick Street was alive and vibrant. It was, it was the place to be. And uh, Charles used to do all the window dressing for all the major uh, stores. And this beautiful, handsome, intelligent, talented man, as uh, he was taken by AIDS, it's a very slow, painful death. As he was taken, he lost his home. He ended up in a board shack in Laventil, and uh, we used to take food for him and watched him slowly die. These were the most horrendous times. And those of us who survive it, I think there's no way that you could come out of something like that and not be energized to fight even harder for your rights and to fight against the awful things that were done to us in our hour of need. There were no assistance from the religious organizations. We were pariahs to everybody in Trinidad and Tobago, you know? So it was uh, a very, very difficult, very difficult time. And it definitely was part of um, what made me more determined to stand up and be counted and to raise my voice against the injustice that we have faced as a community for decades. So, well, thank you very much for sharing that. And we can see that it still has an, an emotional trigger, but thank you for being brave enough to share those memories because as you, as you agreed, people don't really sometimes understand, you know, they see the now, but they don't understand what has come from before. Um, so, so let's use that as a segue then to look at this case. So the younger generations, myself included, we're going about our business. We have gay clubs in Trinidad and Tobago. We have parties. We now have Grinder, where some of us are holding hands. You know, we're, we're, we're living our, our lives, some of us. Um, those of us that have privileges, and I, I always, as someone with privilege, I talk about that openly. I say some of us, you know, we live in our little bubbles. Um, we, to some of us, we weren't even really concerned with the law. We weren't, we weren't thinking 
as you said, that there were these colonial laws that remained on the books that could in some way impact our existence. And, and even persons who are more vulnerable, they themselves are caught up in survival mood and they are caught up in their daily survival and existence. So they may not have themselves stopped to even think about, well, what are the laws really saying about me as a citizen? You know, am I an equal or equitable, equitably protected citizen? Help us understand then, you touched on it, you were getting into it, but what really made you think, you know, even though things seem to be getting better, it was important for me to bring this motion, to look at these laws and to, to take the government to task on it. Uh, why, why not just leave it alone? I mean, the government elsewhere has said, we don't, we don't enforce these laws. When they look at the Immigration Act, for example, they went to the Caribbean Court of Justice and said, we don't enforce these laws. They're like dead laws. Why? 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 after all these years of activism, all this pain and, and, and turmoil, why take on these laws if they're not really thought about by other people or impacting us? Help us understand that. Well, I think uh, what, what is important for people to know about uh, my history and the history of the LGBT movement in UK is uh, the law that I assisted to change in 1997, which was around the immigration rights of the overseas partner of a UK citizen. That was the first positive gay legislation in the United Kingdom post decriminalization 30 years previously. So what I saw was this, this idea of parliament if they decriminalize, or if it's through the courts, people think that that's the end of the journey, when actually that's just the beginning. And when we had this change of law in the United Kingdom that I was a part of developing, all of a sudden things started to snowball and things started to domino and things started to move forward. We have to understand something. They are different arms of government and the judiciary is one of them. If your parliamentarians are not willing to be uh, brave in taking up the mantle of human rights for the LGBT community, then you have another course of action, which is the, the judiciary. Now, the reason why this has never been attempted before in Trinidad and Tobago is because of something called the Savings Law Clause. Section six of our constitution uh, when we became independent in 1962, the then government, um, Prime Minister Dr. Eric Williams, inserted into the Constitution Section 6, which is a savings clause that insulates any laws that predates our independence. So all of the colonial era laws, death penalty, buggery law, Toot bagai, you can't drive bareback, all of these ridiculous laws, two people of the same sex can't rent a hotel room, the immigrant, all of these things uh, were insulated from any challenge in court. So none of us thought that this was possible because section six comes above section 13, the buggery law. So whatever is, is the number higher, everything else comes under it. Luckily, uh, in, in London, I was having conversations with people about, you know, let's find a way. There has to be a way. You can't just lock down a, con a constitution like this. And I met this guy, Peter Laverick, who is a mixed race gay man. And he said to me, Jason, I, I think I found a way. I mean, he just, you know, listened to me go on and on about, let's do this. Let's find a way. And he did it all on his own time. And he came to me one day and he said, Jason, I think I found a way. He gave me his, his document. I read the strategy and I am not a lawyer. I, I understood it. It made perfect sense to me. And listen, if it made sense to me, I knew it would make sense to a judge. And I also know that, you know, Trinidad and Tobago, we have moved forward a lot in terms of the um, ideas around LGBT and who we are as people. 
And I also knew that with the current Attorney General and the current uh, Chief Justice and a judiciary that was fair on issues around human rights, I thought, right, I have the strategy. I have a Chief Justice and Attorney General that I, I truly believe will support this and make sure that we get a fair hearing in court. And I said, right, roll the dice, let's do it. And um, nobody believed that it was possible. And uh, unfortunately, I, I'm not willing to share my strategy. You know, when you're in the, in the throes of a legal matter, I'm not going to be sharing my strategy with Joe Public. So um, people just thought, oh, well, you know, this crazy queen is, you know, just stirring the pot. But we had a very specific strategy and a winning strategy. And it had been looked over by some of the greatest legal minds. You know, Rishi Das teaches constitutional law at the University of the West Indies. So when Rishi Das joined my team supporting this strategy, you know, I had great legal minds who all said this was sound law. So I knew walking up those steps that I was already a winner. And, you know, time had moved forward. And I think after the Belize judgment in 2016, you know, everybody was like just ready for this to happen. And it all came together in the right time, in the right space, with the right team. And, you know, I, I, I'm very blessed that I was able to put it all together. Let me be very clear. It was a lot of work. I have had to raise all of this money myself. You know, this case has cost over six million TT dollars so far. All of this I have raised myself and all of it, all of the logistics of it I have run on my own uh, because nobody would support it. Nobody believed that it would happen. But um, I felt very strongly that we needed, uh, what's the paddles? When you, when you shock somebody back into life, <laughs> I felt very strongly that the LGBT movement in Trinidad and Tobago needed <laughs> A, a, a jolt back into life and I thought well this is this is it and I had the incredible opportunity to be able to do it I'm very 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 lucky and privileged to have been able to have led it and to have won well, you know you raise a couple of things there that I want us to explore a little bit now to get the mechanics out of the way n now that it's in public record I understand you could not have shared the strategy earlier, but would you mind for the listeners just breaking down very simply what, how you were probably able to circumnavigate that savings clause or just break down to them what you did so that they can appreciate that part of it. And then there's something else you raised that I want to get into. Well, it's not my strategy. It's Peter Laverick, you know. Agre agreed. Oh, yes. So. All, all <laughs> you know. due credit to Peter. Yes. Oh, yeah. No, listen, I, I, please, it, not me. But um, the strategy was this. Um, the buggery law and the sexual indecency law, sections 13 and 16 of the Sexual Offences Act, were protected by the savings law clause. So the savings law clause insulated them from any legal challenge. So if you had brought this law, just if you just challenged this law by itself and said, oh, judge, this law is discriminatory, the judge will say, well, sorry, section six, savings law clause trumps that, you have no case, and throw it up. That's what everybody expected uh, with, my, with my case. What Peter and uh, Rishi and Richard Drabble were able to do was to look into our constitution. And this was, let me tell you, Peter Laverick deserves the biggest thank you from our community. It was hours and hours of streaming through parliamentary documents, through Hansard, through every mention of LGBTQ, buggery, etc., for the last 60 years. And what they found, were, well, what Peter found, was that in uh, 1976, the country went into the buggery law and extended the jail time. And then in 1986, the parliament did the same thing, went into the buggery law and extended the jail time again. It was extended twice. So by touching the law, what they were saying was, we have repealed the original law by extending the jail time. 
So the argument in court was not about the Bagri law itself. It was not about the human rights of LGBT people. It was a fight between section six and the savings clause and how that impinges on all other laws. And let me tell you something, what people need to realize about the power of that judgment is we not only remove section 13 and 16 that discriminate against LGBT people, we have now taken a very big ax to the, the savings law clause, which now gives us full democracy. The government of, for the future can never hide behind section six any longer because of the Jason Jones judgment. So things like the death penalty, now, I know the death penalty is a very contentious issue. I know many people want the reintroduction of the death penalty. I know many LGBT people want the reintroduction of the death penalty. But let me say this. There are 10 countries around the world that criminalize LGBT people with the death penalty. So if you support the death penalty in Trinidad and Tobago, what you are supporting is the death of LGBT people around the globe. The death penalty must be removed. The death penalty is not human rights. An eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. So for me and my work around human rights, I can't just see blinkeredly about you know, what I do in my bedroom. I have to see the bigger picture of what human rights looks like and who is entitled to human rights. So, when Peter came up with this brilliant strategy, and of course, you know, th there are lots of other strands that come into it, but it was very basically saying, if the government of Trinidad and Tobago went into these laws twice to extend the, the penalty of jail time, then they are new laws. Now, I know people want to talk about what happened in the Senate on Monday. This is precisely why he's saying he does not want to touch the law until he has a Jones judgment. If he goes into any law and speaks around LGBT rights without the Jason Jones judgment, you are then opening, as his words were, a Pandora's box that will defeat all of this work and the work that can happen after a Jones judgment at the Privy Council. There are 26 laws that will fall under this judgment. So he is doing exactly the right thing for our community by saying, everybody hold up, let's wait until this judgment happens because it will impact on all of these laws. So the Domestic Violence Act as it stands still protects same-sex couples. We have not lost anything, but what, it, what he's saying is, if the Jones judgment is successful at the Privy Council, it will impact that act, it will impact 23 other acts. We have to be careful about what we wish for. You don't want a slither of pie today when you can have the whole pie five years from now. This is strategy. This is how you build a movement. Don't grab for the, for the one mango when you can have 15 in five days time. So let, let me use that then as we, there are a couple pink elephants in the room, right? So I know you're not shy from controversy, right? And personally, I think it's important to have open discourse about some of these issues because it makes no sense us throwing you talk about uh, grabbing mangoes, but it's no sense pelting at mangoes um, in the open and then, you know, it lands nowhere, but just causes a set of mess on the ground. So yeah, I always- What, what I would say, uh -huh. what, let, let me just interject here. I think the amendment was very powerful. I think it needed to happen. I support it 100%. And what we have to see as a victory and this is what I want to be very clear with people about. What happened in, Sen in the Senate last Monday was incredibly positive. We may not have gotten the amendment, but people have to listen to the language and what happened in that Senate on Monday. We were spoken about, our same-sex relationships were spoken about with honor 
and dignity. People were, our, our community was respected. This has never happened in our democratic history. That is a victory. So I totally support what went on. I totally support the action for the amendment. But sometimes you have to lose to win. Well, okay, that's what I was going to ask you about. Now, in some circles, there was reluctance, as you just, you, you, you referred to, there was reluctance to support your action, not just because people were ignorant of the strategy, right? Uh, I think I saw elements of fear, I saw elements of a belief that if we lost this, it would have the opposite effect of what you just explained to us. What is your perspective on some of the reluctance and the backlash that you have faced um, leading up to the, the matter and since then? What, what do you think that is about and how can we overcome that as a, as a community of activists and just general members of the community? Well, um, the first thing I would say to people is um, the case is Jason Jones v. Attorney General of Trinidad and Tobago. As a citizen, as a born and bred citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, I am fully entitled to address the courts on matters that affect me personally. I don't need anybody's opinion. I don't need anybody's authority to do such. So that's the first point I want to make very clear. And I encourage everybody to do the same thing in their own lives. Stand up for yourself, stand up for what you believe in and do what you think is empowering for you or for your organization or for your community. That's number one, we live in a democracy. Secondly, I think that we have this uh, fallacy in the LGBTQ plus movement globally that all of us have to be sat around a, a, a campfire singing Kumbaya songs to each other. I disagree completely. I think we are all on very different journeys. We are all living very different lives. Rudy, you speak about your privilege. You have come from a very privileged background. You don't know what it is like to take a taxi or to go fight up with city gate to go home. So you cannot speak for other people who are living those lives. I cannot speak for those people that are living those lives. All I can speak for is myself and my experience as a Trinbagonian and my experience as a global ambassador for human rights. So I, I think we have to understand something. We are all headed for the same journey. We're all headed for the same uh, goal, but we don't need to be in the same car. If somebody wants to go there on foot, go. If somebody wants to go there by bus, go. If somebody wants to go there by boat, go. Why are we fighting each other when we're all trying to reach the same destination? Because if your boat break down in the Gulf, if so-and-so bus get a flat tire on Beatum, if so-and-so feet hurt, at least the journey is being continued through other ve vehicles. We have to be aware there is not one route to equality. And all of our fights are equally important. And to tear down each other because we have different routes to equality is defeating ourselves. We're shooting ourselves in the foot. So let me tell you, my back broad, I could, they could pelt me like a mango as they want. I will take it and I will get on with my job. I stand on what I have achieved. And I'm the only human being on this planet that has achieved the changing of laws in two countries. The only person. So pelt away, pelt away, I good. I'm just getting on with what I'm doing. And obviously I've had certain successes. No, and I think that's important uh, because you're right. People see the world in different perspectives. So for example, that's why on our committee last year when we when we focused on the trans community to recognize their role in starting all of this in, in terms of pride 
um, we were so privileged and humbled to have people like Brandy Rodriguez and others speak their own truth and speak their own lived experience. And, but people come to life with different lived experiences and perspectives. And it was, I think it was instructive for me. I mean, I learned, as I said before, some of my activism from people like Danny, yourself, Godfrey. You know, sometimes I, I hear that that type of activism is, is not suited to the times that we live in. And there are things that we did and said uh, that did not cause the kind of furor that it causes today. And as an activist yourself coming from that era and now having to operate in the contemporary system, what are some of the challenges you may face or more importantly, how do you deal with those challenges to check yourself where you need to or to navigate those spaces so that you build the kind of collaboration that we all want at the end of the day? Even if we're in different boats, as you say, we, should, we shouldn't be shooting the guns at each other in the open ocean. We should try and be going after the Columbus statues of the world um, rather than each other. So how do you, how do you navigate that? Um, you know, it, it's obviously incredibly difficult, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm fighting the homophobes and I'm fighting within my own community. But what I, what I have learned after 33 years of doing this work and the successes that I've had is that, uh, you know, when the disagreements happen, when people are, for whatever reason, attacking your work, you have to be uh, fully authentic with yourself. You have to have a team around you that are feeding you the right information, not a bunch of psychophants. I mean, my team, I, I, I still can't believe the team that I have around me. I have the most amazing team of people working around me and I give them full, full uh, uh, power to call me out if I'm spouting any bullshit or if I'm talking the wrong talk. You know, I do not have that kind of ego. My team are dream builders. My teamwork is the dream work. And I have this amazing, do you know what it's like to sit in a room of the kinds of legal minds that have delivered this victory for us? And I'm not a lawyer. To sit in those conversations where I've had to, literally train myself as a lawyer so that I can understand what's being said in the room. And they respect that because when, when they do start talking, I can interject intelligently from a place of knowledge and they know that I've done my homework to be able to, to interact with it. I'm not just the name on a piece of paper. I've literally had to learn the law. I've had to learn parliamentary constitution, and judiciary. I've had to learn the whole thing in a matter of five years. And I'm incredibly proud of the people that I am surrounded with, who are not just uh, 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 powerful in themselves, and the fact that I give them the, the platform to be powerful alongside of me, but I'm incredibly, uh, I'm incredibly proud to enable them to call me on my bullshit, right? Now, I am not perfect. And definitely, well, actually, I haven't made too many mistakes where this case is gone because I won. But uh, what I will say is this. They have brought to me so many powerful gifts that I am now recognized internationally as one of the most important LGBT activists in history. And that is a team building. And I'm very grateful to all of them. And I'm very grateful to Godfrey and all of the all of my ancestors who also helped develop who I am today. You know, it's, it's interesting listening to you because in my own self-reflection, and I'm sure others on the call uh, will say the same about themselves, 
you can learn so much from a fellow activist. Now, full disclosure, even though we've known each other for a very long time, we don't always see eye to eye on matters. But yet here we can sit across the table, or unfortunately virtually, but I know we could sit across the table and have a drink and let go some cuss, but find a way around and back together as we move forward. And that leads me to the next question, which is, okay, you've won at the first court, right? As you yourself said, you, it has to go, it will, and the Attorney General himself has said, we want to see this go all the way to the Privy Council. What, if any, kind of support or activism would you like to see from the domestic community to aid you in continuing on that journey? Because it's going to be a long journey. And of course, there is going to be an expensive journey, but there are other elements of it. So I'm asking you openly and honestly, how can we help you to help us in this, in this journey that you are still ongoing? Well, full disclosure, Rudy, uh, you've said this to me for the last three years and nothing has materialized. Yes, as a matter of fact, when we launched the Sasha Fierce Fund yesterday, or yes, yesterday, the issue of funding, for example, came up again. And one of the matters that we want to support at least for, I'm speaking from the Pri TT committee. I can't speak for the rest of the community, but from the Pri TT committee and the other members on the call can bear me out on this. We have always said that if we can make enough money to have a profit, we would want to contribute financially. But I think to, to even amass the money to support you, because what you're doing is, I mean, we could give you a thousand dollars but that's a drop in the bucket, right? But, but. Uh, uh, no, it isn't, Rudy. I, I, pay, I pay all of my calls. I do international calls. Right now I am up at 2.45 a.m. doing this work. Nobody pays me a salary. So listen, if you give me $10, I'll be happy. Thank you. <laughs> okay, no, but, and I'm glad you said that. that's fine. That's fine. But I think that we can do more to inveigle the community itself to support this initiative. Because speaking personally, even from Prititi's point of view, we still see a level of complacence and a level of people enjoy the outcome, but they don't seem to want to be part of the outputs that get you to that outcome. And there are many people, privileged LGBTQ people in the country, who I think can do more to support their, their community and to support the kind of work that you're doing and the work that we are doing and others. Because I know that there are other NGOs who have been around for decades and they find themselves in need of resources even after so long. So would, I don't know if you, have an idea or an activity that you would like to do. And maybe this is where you can talk about your fund that you, it was a foundation that you've set up um, where we can publicly here on this call, find a solution to assist you once and for all with the journey that you're on. Um, what, I, what I would say is uh, we're, we're, we're about to launch the new foundation and uh, that, that's still a work in progress, um, but we are registered and, and things are happening behind the scenes. Um, we managed to raise 16,500 US dollars for the Trans, uh, Trans Tobago Trans Coalition. Um, over the last uh, month, we have been feeding people, getting them back on HIV meds, paying part rents, you know, so the work is happening behind the scenes. You know, I, I'm not, you know, I think, I think I'm, I'm a bit of a victim uh, of my own success because I don't go, you know, with a flag saying, oh, look at what I've done, look at what, you know, our team has done. 
you know, we just get on with the work, especially in an emergency pandemic situation. We just got on with the work. And it was really shocking to me to hear that local organizations were attacking uh, the trans coalition for working with me without even asking how that work happened, where that money was coming from. But let me make it very clear publicly right now, that money was money earmarked for my work. The, uh, found the, um, the Frontline AIDS uh, organization in the United Kingdom, which is the only organization in the world that has supported my decriminalization case, um, very kindly redirected the money that was earmarked for, for my and my team's work to help with the issue of trans and HIV positive people in Trinidad and Tobago and the hardships that they were encountering. So this was not new money. This was old money that I negotiated to get to, to, to the trans coalition. Now, I am really disgusted to hear that local NGOs were attacking Brandy and the trans coalition for working with me. That kind of pettiness has to stop. It's, uh, it's really disgusting, to be honest with you, to, to attack me and my team for assisting a marginalized community in a global pandemic is the lowest of the low. So in you terms know, of moving forward, yes. and in terms of moving forward, you know, the, the team that, that we are building now around the foundation, you know, we're, we're, we're making a very strong statement, which is the local, the local organizations have been gatekeeping and they have been stopping work happening unless their branding and their personalities are all over it. And we refuse to engage with that kind of petty infighting. The infighting has stopped work happening in Trinidad and Tobago. International organizations will not touch us anymore until we sort out the infighting. Now, I'm happy to sit in rooms like this and discuss this and try and iron out all the difficulties. But if people start, continue the personal attacks on me, I will withdraw, which is what I've done. And I want to, as, as again, someone who's known you for a long time, I want to let people know that that is not because you can't take people on. I know you can, but that, that is the same level of maturity that we have had to have as well. We want to commiserate with you that people launch personal attacks. And, I, and this conversation is not just about the law, but it's about how you have activism that supports this kind of work. There have been many personal attacks levied against our organization, and we have chosen not to engage publicly in that type of battle. But what I will say is that the door remains open, like your door remains open, and people can enter and exit as they see fit. And sometimes you have to stand on the table because there are not enough chairs around the table, but you have to be present and be part of it. And one of the things that we have learned is that people can, and you just talked about it, people can have activism in their own boat. To, put, to use your words, do your activism, let me do mine, you do yours, and we go down the road together. What I wanted to ask you, though, in relation to, do, do you think that, the, I've heard people say that hurt people hurt people. And you obviously have suffered trauma, and we spoke about it earlier. But in this type of work, how do we support each other given that specific consideration that everyone has their, version, their own trauma that they've been dealing with? How do you manage Very simply. It? Yeah. Very simply, hush your mouth. You know, if somebody is in, in their car going their way to what they see is equality, hush your mouth. 
what is equality for a trans woman in Trinidad and Tobago is not what is equality for you, Rudy, right? You enjoy a huge amount of, of equality. I enjoy a huge amount of equality. I am not going to tell the trans community what their equality should look like. Hush your mouth. Let everybody be themselves and find their way to what, the, what life they want to lead and what equality they want. We must lift each other up. And if you, if you don't agree, hush your mouth simple well one thing we do agree with you now I, there's one thing in your um in your bio that peeves me and that's simply that you went to that other place because of course i went to the royal college of the queens so <laughs> but i'll forgive that but what what i can agree with you on is the issue of money and raising money uh Legal fees in particular are their own brand of expensive. And I think people don't understand that a lawyer's time is his commodity in trade or her or a non-binary attorney's time is theirs in trade. But we have not at Pritity gone out to any international funders. We have not, we've deliberately not gone to any corporate funders because we've always said that our work should be funded by the community and for the community. And part of the reason that we do that is that I think it's important, and we touched on it earlier, that people have a sense of responsibility, that if you want to enjoy this work, you need to put something in the kitty. If it's, as you said, $10, $100, what have you. And at the same time, those of us that are privileged can support activities like most of our activities have always been free so that even those that are more vulnerable and don't have money to even pay for their taxi fare sometimes they can attend an event and not have to worry about a contribution but i think it's a, a, an opportune time to let you know something that the group has decided and that is that 10 percent of all the profit that we make from the community donations this year will be a starting donation to Jones VTNT or as to be used as you see fit. And we'll start there, but we know, I know personally Privy Council is going to be very expensive and we would like to work with you and the foundation to run domestic funding campaigns specifically to support your work as it continues. Because as you said, if we win at the, when we win at the Privy Council, those 26 laws will cascade down and we can then all celebrate. But we have to be part of it and we have to be responsible. So we commit that to you publicly here tonight. And we were waiting to tell you that because we wanted it to be a little bit of a surprise. But, but it, and it's a public commitment that we cannot now run away from. So we will be doing that to support you as best as we can. Now, on that note, I wanted well, to- well, can, I just, can I just say yeah, thank sure. you? Um, it, uh, it's very emotional. And I'm, I'm hugely grateful to PriTT for, for this bequest. Um, I, I, I've worked so hard. I literally have had to sell some of my mother's jewelry and paintings for my uncle to be able to do this work. So I truly appreciate it. Thank you. No, it is, it is definitely our our privilege to support the work that you're doing and as as we know you don't get the funding the same way we don't get a lot of funding um you don't get a lot of funding from other donors you have as you said thank you for sharing that openly about your struggles we we don't get any funding from international donors so we appreciate your work and we want to support it and we'd be glad to now it's 10 o'clock and we have a few more minutes on the call. Um, I wanted to remind people that they can send, this is our Q&A session. Um, you can send your, your questions through or you can raise your hand and ask Jason a question. And while you do that, we actually have one initial question for you, Jason. Um, well, I'm not, I guess it's an open question. Maybe you can comment on it, but someone wants to know 
what about the Equal Opportunity Commission and of course the Equal Opportunity Act? What, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase their question a bit so that it's more uh, relatable to, to you because I know that you are focused on, but you, you might be able to share. What is the Equal Opportunity Commission and by extension, the Equal Opportunity Act doing and or impacting on work, uh, this type of work and the, and the LGBTQI community? Um, like any comments on that that you'd like to share? I mean, it, it, it's, it's, I think everybody, it's public knowledge that the Equal Opportunity Act 2000 expressly denies protections for LGBTQ plus people. Now, I think this is a good point for me to make very clear what needs to happen moving forward. However, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit drifty since your offer of money. I always cry when people offer me money. <laughs> Sorry. I make such a terrible hoe in Murray Street. You're like, oh, you want to pay me? <laughs> no, don't worry. You're among friends tonight. Oh, among friends. Wrong sense. So uh, let, me, let me make this very, very clear about the, um, about the Jones judgment and our constitution. What the Attorney General was speaking about in, in the Senate on uh, last Monday and the reason why he did not support the amendment to include same-sex uh, relationships. It's, I, I really request that everybody watch what he said and not what is being said by other commentators because they're putting their spin on it rather than exactly the words of the Attorney General. What he said was, I support same-sex relationships being included, but I cannot at this time because of the Jason Jones matter still pending. If you, if you have a legal matter that is before the courts and it has not reached a final conclusion and that judgment will then impact on all these other laws, it is not right for parliamentarians to engage with any conversation about addressing these laws until they have the judgment from the Privy Council. Now, this is an important point of parliamentary procedure. This is an important point about the marriage of the judiciary and our parliament and our constitution. We have a very big moment ahead of us. Now, I'm very proud that it's my name on, on, the, on the claim form, but forget me in this. Ignore Jason Jones and just call it LGBT people against the government of Trinidad and Tobago. If that wins, and the Attorney General fully expects it to win, he said that, he said as much on Monday in the Senate. All laws that impinge on our human rights will then be up for review and replace, amend, whatever. So we're talking from the Immigration Act to same-sex marriage to two people renting a room in a, ho in, a, in a hotel. All of these things, we can win. We have to understand that right now, it's about a little bit of patience. Now, I'm not saying don't make attempts as Senator Thompson IE did. I think that's brilliant because it brings it into the public domain and it keeps us on the front burner and it keeps pushing the argument. What we need to do now is push the argument saying, okay, well, if you're saying you ain't doing nothing till the Jones judgment of the Privy Council, get it happening. Call up the appeal court in Trinidad and Tobago and say, where is the date? get things moving. If he is hiding behind the Jones judgment so that he can't do anything, well then push to get the Jones judgment before the appeal court, push to get the Jones judgment before the Privy Council. Okay. We, um, cannot, we cannot accept just a little slither of pie now when we have the whole cake coming. And that's why I said publicly that he is doing the best thing for the LGBT community. 
and it's good to have divergent perspectives. And I'm glad you're sharing, you're openly sharing yours tonight because you're right. People go down the road sometimes with one narrative and they don't look at the entire picture. And, you know, you aren't the only one that gets criticized. I'm not the Pri TT and, and other people's work. There's been a lot of criticism about the ongoing work because a number of people in the community that I speak with um, over the years, they, they have formed the opinion that a lot of advocacy has been going on for decades and they don't seem to be benefiting by it. And I think that with your call to action, it not only recognizes that advocacy has to have its place and can be done differently on one side, but we, the community, it takes two hands to clap or maybe many hands to clap. We have to get involved and push and, and be active about it. And, and that's why I said we always launch pride at parliament, but I do think we, there's more that we can also do as an organization. So I'm glad you made that call to action tonight. And we will talk with you more about it after on, offline, and let's see how we can run that, you know, that that call to action, and really push people to get out there and help move the thing along, right? Well, this is this is my point, Rudy. You know, I'm I'm a person of action. If you get a failure, as we did last week Monday, don't sit there calling cowardice and this and that. You pick yourself up and you find the next way forward, right? Now, if the government is saying, and, and the opposition, obviously, by their abstention from the vote, if the government and the opposition are saying they're waiting on the Jones judgment, well, then push for a Jones judgment. Get active and say, okay, if you are being cowardly and waiting for a Jones judgment, give us a judgment. Right. Now, uh, we should let people on the call know that Senator Ayi wanted to be uh, on the call for a few minutes tonight, but Senate is also sitting. And what we decided is we would focus on Jason and his, his activism. And then what we will do, like we do with other events during Pride, we will replicate these discussions. And we could probably have one evening to talk about that in its entirety. Uh, someone asked, if there are any comments on NIBTT benefits for same-sex partners, such as insurance, health coverage for same-sex partners, survivorship rights. Uh, Jason, in your work, uh, has this come up as well? Is there anything you can share with them? Um, yeah, uh, actually, very interestingly, uh, this has come up uh, in the last six months. Um, I would engage anybody to please email us. Um, we're looking for uh, examples. You see, we need examples where there was uh, an infraction in the law or where there was injustice. We, you, we can't just go and ask for something unless we have an example. So please uh, contact me or my team. Um, I'll put up my, my email address, our email address. Yes, you can put the, it in the chat, uh, chat. And we will continue yeah. to share it as well, with your permission. Yeah. But, but anybody who is suffering any injustice, whatever it is, please, we need to start documenting this. It's very difficult to go to authorities and say, oh, this is wrong, unless you have accompanying examples of where the infraction was. So the more examples we have of these infractions, the stronger our case is for equality. So whatever your problem is as an LGBT person, reach out to Pride TT, reach out to, to Jones VTNT, reach out to anybody that you can and say, please help me or this happened to me so that we can start collating this information. And again, the, the team at Pride TT had already committed in previous discussions that any data that we collect, we are openly sharing it with all LGBTQI activists. We don't keep the data to ourselves. It's not our precious gold. So we will definitely share with you what, because we're doing a needs assessment as well right now, which is supposed to feed into uh, a marginal, what we call the empowerment manifesto 
as I said, it's an election year. And any data that we collect, we will share with you if it can help you in your fight, um, then power to you. Um, someone is asking about blood donation. Now, this is something that's particularly close to me because I believe and that if I don't donate blood because I don't like to act unethically and if I need to donate blood for those who don't know in Trinidad and Tobago, you would have to probably lie on the form because it asks you about if you're a man who has sex with men. And we know that that has come up in other territories. It's not a law per se, Jason, but it's a regulation. And I think that that is something that is a low hanging fruit that maybe we can also activate and uh, around and, and get changed. Uh, you know, especially yeah. as, as someone who, who has the experience with HIV. You know, how, how does that, something like that, a regulation like that, impact you and what is the experience in England for example is it the same or it, it, it is the same in the United States and pretty much across Europe um, interestingly since COVID-19 um, a very strange anomaly has happened with uh, LGBT people particularly gay men and HIV positive men around the whole uh, issue of blood donation now when you talk about uh, strategy and low-hanging fruit you know, this has to be a, a cross conversation. This is the one time when all of us in our different boats and planes and cars and walking need to come together and discuss it and, and figure out which are the strongest uh, low hanging fruits to pelt. Uh, there are things in Trinidad and Tobago that we can go for that I think would make a much stronger case as we lead up to the Privy Council ruling on, on my judgment. So that conversation needs to happen. But again, the gatekeeping has to stop. There are a lot of people who just think I know better and I know this and I know, I'm so tired of it. I'm so tired of it. You know, anybody who wants to talk to me and I, I reiterate this, anybody who wants to talk to me, email me. My email is all over my Facebook, all over my social media. I am a people reach out to me from, from Timbuktu to Rajasthan. I don't know why Trinidad and Tobagoans feel they can't talk to me. Yet they want to attack me on Facebook, they want to attack me on social media, and they want to attack me in the press. Why, they, why you can't just call me and say, Jason, what you meant by that? Jason, what you doing now? Jason, what you, what you want to do next? Jason, can we help you? Jason, can you help us? Well, on that note, Pride Yui has sent you a message for those who can't see the chat. They would like to say thank you to you so much for all that you have done for the LGBTQ plus community and all that you continue to do. And this is a young, these are people in university, yeah? Pride Yui. And they, some of them are like, you know, in their, still in their teens. They, 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 they're still where we would like to be sometimes. But they are looking at us. Um, I'm going to put my, I'm going to take some liberty and put myself in the boat as a, of an elder compared to their ages. Um, I think what you're talking about is important for people like that as well. They're looking to us, especially now that we are more open and you are out there. Um, in the past, some of our elders haven't been as public in the general community. They've been public in our LGBT community. Um, I think it's important for us to show them what is right and to set a different example uh, and give them the baton sometimes, but also guide them. Because I think if we are not careful, they might take signals from us that are not always the most beneficial for them. What, what, what would you say to young people out there looking on and who want to be activists, etc.? I mean, I, I know in Caribbean community, there is this kind of deference to age, you know? It's just like uh, when, when somebody's your uncle or your auntie or your granny or, you know, <laughs> I mean, I remember calling taxi drivers uncle, you know, that's, that's, that's yeah. you deferred to age. And I think that's one of the issues. I think a, a lot of young people 
are very afraid to approach um, somebody who's elderly. I, I use that word you know, loosely. <laughs> but uh, what I would say is, you know, please, you know, just send me a message, whatever it is. I was very blessed um, just after I filed the case in 2017. I received three uh, messages on my Facebook Messenger from um, three young gay, gay people. Um, all of them were in prestige schools, two in San Fernando, one in Port of Spain. And all three of them were plotting their suicide because they couldn't see a future for them in Trinidad and Tobago being gay. And they said they saw me on CNC3 speaking about this challenge and, and you know the vision that I had for changing the laws in Trinidad and Tobago. And they, they reached out to me to say, you know, this is the first time I've felt hope. So I think opening up those dialogues and opening up those channels is very important. I hope that, you know, the reason why I do all of these events at three o'clock in the morning <laughs> is because I hope people get to know me they get to realize that, you know, yes. I'm not Jason Jones, yes. that guy. I'm a real human being. You know, listen, in, in, in this <laughs> carob cup is not coffee, it's fucking <laughs> wine. No, I, I want to, I want to actually attest to what you're saying because I've heard people say that about your work and others. You know, when, when people become public, you get that kind of feedback. They, they say, you know, I didn't know that you could do this or you could be successful. We have a, an activity every year called Generation Gap, uh, and it's deliberately GAP for what some people remember, Gap, they thought it stood for, um, where we bring the elders and the younger people together. And in the very first session, someone who is very dear to my heart actually said to the panel, I never knew people like you existed. I was all alone and I was wondering, would I ever have a successful life? I mean, Mailing was on that panel. Cyrus was on that panel. Anthony Medina, people like Faye was, was uh, on another panel as well, the second one. And young people need to have LGBTQI role models. And it doesn't mean they're looking for perfect, perfect people. They're not looking for messiahs. They're looking for people just like them with flaws, big mouth, with, you know, some gray hair who speak. Yeah, but but you know. Rudy, Rudy, what I, would, what I would say is this is a cultural thing. We come from a culture of respect your elders. And that has stopped the, the communication. That's what we need to break down. And, you know, for us as elders, we also have to recognize that, you know, a lot of times when I'm back home in Trinidad, you know, I go to social occasions. I mean, I met you at the South Trinidad yes, event, yes. you know, in Pinal. Let me tell you, that was a drive and a half. And let me tell you, behind <laughs> God back. But, you know, you, I knew that I had to yes. do these things to make me real to people, you know, because there's this whole thing of, you know, respect your elders and look he on TV and look he doing these things yes. and look he wins awards. And you have to be in the space to make yourself real. So it's really a question of um, addressing the cultural uh, heritage of respect your elders, and also us as elders, making ourselves available. You know, we have to be available. And how you be available is by being on Instagram, being on Facebook, being on TikTok, and, and not speaking down to people, you know, the, the, why, why do you always have to, as an elder, speak down to people and tell them you must do this, you must listen to that, you must, no, shut up, you know? Let young people tell you what they want from you. Don't tell them what they should be doing. I, I, and I know some people have a lot of history inside their brains. They have documents, they, they know where information lies. But again, it's not shared, especially in today's world. People aren't going to sit down and read volumes of documents. They, they consume information differently. And I think you're touching on that as well, that you know, people from different generations need to get with the program. And if they want to engage well, well, people... 
you know, do it differently. Well, I, I, would, I would like to engage with Pride TT. Um, I've just started a project here uh -huh. to do TikToks on LGBT history. And, you know, TikToks right now, you know, that's the voice of young people. Yes. And I did my first TikTok. It was horrible. But, you know, <laughs> I'm trying to learn <laughs> the whole thing. But uh, I've been in discussions uh, the last 24 hours about creating TikToks that, that show LGBT history, you know, the last 51 years of LGBT history. So I would invite Pride TT to come on board with that and do TikToks for uh, Trinbegonian LGBT history. Well, I, I'm sure people on this committee are smiling from ear to ear because I have a TikTok account, but I don't, I wouldn't lie. I'm not ashamed to tell you all. I don't know how to start. I think I'll experiment, but they do. Um, I think Siobhan Charles is on the call. He has a thriving TikTok following. So we will lean on you all. You heard Jason, we're going to lean on you. And look, he's laughing. He's in the chat. He's, he's LOLing. Um, but no, I think that's important, right? We need to use these new platforms and to get our history out there and not let it just sit. Um, I was talking with um, Tobago Pride, the subcommittee, and one of the members, she actually had one of Free Forum, an, an edition of Free Forum magazine, which Danny used to pr pr uh, produce. And I said to her, I said, well, you know, I have some of those. We need to scan those things and put them out on social media. They can't sit in a library, you know? So I'm glad you made that suggestion and that you show you opened it because I think some people are afraid of technology sometimes. So good for you. I, I, I think this is, this is one of the perfect areas of where you can uh, bridge the generation gap. If uh, us oldies have the knowledge and they understand the technology, well then, yeah, let's sit down and do it. And you know, fascinatingly enough, as I said earlier on, before we started filming this, um, Pride 2020 being digital and us all yes. being in rooms across the nation, across oceans, and still being a community. This is a huge change for us. This is amazing and fabulous. You know, I, I, I get a lot of antagonism from people saying, oh, but you're not here. Well, look, I'm here. You're here at three o'clock in the morning your time. Yeah. So what, what's your point? You showed up. You know, I, I, I hear this constantly. Jason Jones lives in London. You know, he could do all of that, but we have to live in it. Listen, I live problems too in London, right? I have issues too. Every LGBT person around the world has issues, whether it be homelessness, poverty, HIV, other med mental health issues, other issues. You know, we all have it. It doesn't matter. That is geography. Can we get geography out of this issue and use the technology that is at our hand to build a, a brand new fabulous community where we all, all hold hands wherever we are, whether it be Penal, whether it be Port of Spain, whether it be London, we're all here right now in this room. So geography doesn't matter anymore. Let's not make it matter anymore. Now it's time check is 1021. Shiv, uh, Shivanand has a suggestion. Um, I like to, res as I said earlier, I like to respect time boundaries. It's, it's, you, some of you might think it's an old fashioned thing, but that's one of the things I keep. I, I, there are some things I think should remain, but I've asked him to, to share the suggestion. Um, you know, Hi. Jason, oh, go ahead. Yes, he's on. I, he's on. First of all, let me apologize for being uh, a bit, for imposing a bit on the call, but I have a suggestion. Now, I was thinking that, okay, so first off, let me start off with saying that I'm a youth ambassador, right? I would have represented this country in, um, in that capacity last year and I would have gone to the United States. Now, what I realize is that they have a really good support system for their people. And in light of that, okay, so for example, in Tulsa, they have what is called an equality center where people of the community having feel uh, a bit down and having been 
gone through a lot of distress with their family. Maybe they were kicked out at some point. They would have gone to that place that was, uh, so to speak, a uh, safe ground for them. Now, I was thinking, what about if we could emulate something like that in Trinidad and Tobago? But I know that such an undertaking would be something for far later down in our adv advocacy, right? But perhaps something a bit uh, more short term that we could try to work on. I know that people of the community, me being one of them, would have had a tremendous problem in terms of, you know, family and, and, and having um, that support system. Can we provide that support system digitally? Because I know that our people, our young people rather, um, we are of a digital age. So my suggestion is, can we or can we not have an app in place that allows people to solicit that support system in times of need, like probably having a 24 seven um, reach out, right? Where they could call somebody and talk to them probably when they are at the verge of suicide or something that is deeply hurting them about the attack that is imposed on people of all communities. So in my, <laughs> to sum it up, I'm asking if that is possible and if so, what is the time frame that we'd be looking at for that to manifest itself? Thank you. Shivanan, thank you for that intervention. And I mean, I like to give credit and we're, we're here tonight as we wrap up uh, talking not just about the case at hand, but the history behind the case. And in a similar fashion, I'll give you a, a long bit of an answer. Uh, there are, there's actually, uh, uh, there have been NGOs focused on that type of support system in the past. And even now today, I, I, don't, I don't know if anyone is on the call from Friends for Life, for example, uh, and if you want to give an answer on your own behalf, I don't like to speak for people, but I will say that they still maintain a support system. I believe that uh, there is also a group called the Sexual Culture of Justice Program. Um, and I, I will be the first to concede that I know not enough people in the community know about some of the programs or some of the, the work that we all do, but um, you can always write us and we can share those people's work with you. Uh, they have had, they, for example, during COVID-19, they had a support network, a call-in center, I believe, uh, where people could find support. Now, that is stopgap. We are trying to look at sustainability. And I think this is a nice uh, opportunity for me to talk about some of these things before we wrap up. Uh, we spoke, I said to you that we want to take pride to the next level, pride 2.0. Uh, I said that placards, protests, parades and parties have their place, but more needs to be done. Exactly what you asked for is what we are going to be focusing on. We want to create uh, sustainable support mechanisms where, for example, we can have uh, a buddy system between senior citizens in the community and younger persons. And if you are passionate about this, as you sound, come on board with us, join with us, and let us build out the systems together. Uh, my partner, actually, Kater and Siobhan, who I mentioned earlier, uh, this was also meant to be a bit of a surprise, but I see no harm in sharing it. They are actually right now working on Pride TT's app. And we want to be uh, a forward thinking organization and launch an app. And there is a button in there for a hotline uh, where you can find support. Uh, it's not an easy thing to, man to navigate and maneuver. And it's not an easy infrastructure to build out because I'll give you one simple example. If there are persons under the age of 18, we have to be very careful, unfortunately, for us, because we want to reach out to them. We were all there at one time, um, but you have to respect uh, some of the legal ramifications that are involved there. But join us, come on board with us, and I don't know if Jason has anything to add as well in terms of you know, answering Shivanan's question. Yes, yeah, Shivanan, thank you so much for that. Um, again, like uh, Pride TT, 
uh, the organization that we are just uh, about to launch um, is going to be looking at exactly that as well. Um, we are way down the road on developing this. And as Rudy says, there are some limitations, but what we have to also face the fact of is we have to surmount those limitations, you know, and we're, we're going to be looking very closely at doing this kind of work in, in not just for LGBT people, but for all people who are in danger. Uh, there is a huge issue around gender-based violence. One in three women of Trinidad and Tobago will face uh, domestic violence from a partner or loved one or family member. This is a huge number and these people, these women have nowhere to go. And then of course, uh, for LGBT youth, over 40% of new homeless people are LGBT. So the, the, this is happening. What I would uh, encourage right now, uh, Pri TT, I'd like to discuss our team, meet with your team so that we are not cross-purposing and that we're all trying to achieve the same thing. And I would also encourage people like you, Shivan, to uh, you know, come on board to, to give us your take on what you want to see happen. We're not getting anywhere right now by the gatekeeping and the, the silos of different organizations and different personalities. It is actually stopping work happening in Trinidad and Tobago. And that is the most frustrating thing. And this is why I've been working alone for so long because I didn't want to be dragged into the mud of this infighting that's been going on. So I think moving forward, my suggestion now, Pri TT, is I, I, I think we need to have a reckoning where we all sit in a room and we have these discussions. We iron out our difficulties. We remove the elements that have been causing the stumbling blocks because there are people who have been causing discord in our community for whatever reason i don't understand it but for whatever reason and i think we need to unify and have a united voice and a united vision moving forward whatever the vision is and whatever the the trajectories are my my focus as as jason jones v the attorney general is obviously uh through the judiciary and legislative change so I, I, that is what I'm looking at. But the new foundation is looking at the much wider implications of human rights. The fact that uh, I cannot ask a straight black man to respect me as a queer, light-skinned, passing gay man for human rights when he doesn't have one, right? So I have to lift everybody up alongside of me. And this is what we have to do with the LGBT community. We have to see that it's important for us to intersect with all areas of society. And that language and the leadership has to represent that. It can't be that we have these uh, personalities that are divisive, that are focused on their own agendas rather than what we're all trying to achieve. So my, my suggestion right now is you know coming out of Pride 2020, uh, Trinidad and Tobago Pride 2020, is that we set a time and a place, a weekend where we all sit in a room and we hash this all out, cuss, carry on, bitch, moan, whine. Hopefully, we will find a way forward for us all. Really quick, so I I really applaud your advocacy, and so I want to ask your. I know that uh, time is very sensitive, so let me be very quick, right? I want to ask your legal opinion in that I heard talk, or rather, I saw an article regarding the reject. Well, not really rejecting, but the um the advocates and against having the discrimination aspect of our community covered being that they outlined that 
it is specifically because of the Pentecostal or a Christian population having withdrawn their vote from any of the political parties that would uh, advocate or would go in favor of our community. How do we plan to counteract that? Because I see this being a problem that is that would inevitably be uh, experienced by any advocacy, right, in any administration, right, because we are looking at the votes of the people and looking at the fact that, um, you know, ultimately they don't want to get votes and anything that they do that would cause people to pull back that vote, right, it will always have a setback. So how is it that we would overcome that? Is it that we would go and uh, probably advocate for a... <laughs> This is very um, ambitious, but advocate for a LGBT political aspect, or <laughs> what is it that we would do that would, um, you know, pull the people towards allowing that discrimination or that um, that anti-domestic abuse uh, part of our community? How would we do that? Shivanan, that's such a great question. And uh, I, I, I will say this to you. Um, what we have to recognize is that there are dark forces against us and they are powerful voices. They are a powerful political lobby. If the uh, Hindu people remove support, if the Christians or the evangelicals remove support, all political parties are aware of this. And this is why I'm saying that the decision by the Attorney General to defer until judgment by the Privy Council on my case was the right thing to do. What he did was he defused that bomb. Because when the judgment happens, then nobody can say, oh, well, we're taking away votes from you because you're supporting LGBT. What, they, what our parliamentarians can say is, well, we have been told by our Supreme Court that this is what must happen. Strategy is very key at this moment. And we must be patient on the course of justice. What I am doing very specifically about strategy is giving the parliamentarians an out. And yes, many quarters are saying it's cowardice. Whatever you want to color it, that is the fact of the reality that we're dealing with. So let us find the best way forward. And for right now, and the proof in the pudding is the judgment that happened in the Senate, is that if you do not focus on the Jones judgment, you're going to lose tooth by guy. We have an opportunity with the Jones judgment to not only change the Domestic Violence Act, but to give us human rights on all 23 pieces of legislation that discriminate against us. Further to that, the Jason Jones judgment of the Privy Council will also imbue many other countries with those rights. So countries like St. Vincent, St. Lucia, Montserrat, St. Kitts Nevis, Antigua, Grenada, Mauritius, they will all benefit from the Jason Jones judgment. So we're talking about a global movement where Trinidad and Tobago is at the center. You know what really frustrates me, Shiva, Shivanan, is that uh, at no time, even after my, my victory, impacted on 75 million LGBT people in India. At no time has PRITT or any LGBT organization said publicly to me, thank you for what you have done. That, that hurts, especially after how much I have sacrificed to win this judgment. And my legal team who have Definitely. worked tirelessly for the last four years to do this.
so I could understand how it hits and you know being the advocate that you are for people who are oppressed you have not thrown a blind eye and so it is your bounden duty to you know just continue to support us and give us that support system that you have given us so uh sir you have been uh very influential in my development as a youth because i am actually 18 years old and you have given me that sense of you know pride in the pride community in trinidad and tobago seeing that you have strongly advocated for people who have absolutely been oppressed it is very applaudable so i thank you for that for all of your efforts across the world you have not gone unrecognized i've been following you head on tail <laughs> and i will continue to follow and support you from my heart and continue to advocate for this community and for your work so thank you so much for your time and answering my questions and thank you to everybody who has been so accommodating it really has been a refreshing uh, experience having voiced my opinion and my concerns. So thank you so much and God bless. Thank you very much, Shivanan. So we're going to wrap up, but just a few points. Uh, on Shivanan's question, actually, every Wednesday night, Shivanan, um, I encourage everyone to check out the website to see the entire calendar, but every Wednesday this Pride Month, we're having town halls entitled Queer Votes Count. And it's all about exactly what you're asking. How can we engage a political directorate? We've actually invited them to be part of it. Let's see if they're brave enough, like Jason is, to show up in the room and talk with us. And actually on Tuesday the 7th, uh, we are going to have members of faith from the Anglican faith, the evangelical faith, in a town hall discussion, uh, hopefully Hindu faith as well, and Islam, um, to talk about how LGBTQ persons of faith experience, you know, the, 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 the harm, the injury, the trauma from some leaders of faith, and how can we overcome that? And um, uh -huh, can ahead. I just inter can yes. I just interject there, Rudy, with a with a suggestion? Sure. I I think that where a lot of activism goes wrong is that we do not give people the tools to be activists. So what I would suggest, um, three things that I would suggest: uh -huh. if we could come up with a document that says we are we as LGBTQ plus Trinbagonians demand respect from all political parties in the next general election. And uh, another document to faith mm -hmm. leaders saying we as LGBTQ plus people of people of faith, whether, and then you can fill in, I am Roman Catholic, I am Hindu, I am Muslim, I am Buddhist, whatever it is, and okay. say we demand that you stand up and respect LGBTQ people and stop the rhetoric against us. And then the third thing, that I, I encourage everybody to do tonight is to join your political party. I am totally nonpartisan. I don't, you know, what party I support, that's my business. And it's your business too. But you have to join the party. You have to pay your subscription so that you have a voice and you have a vote. So my suggestion is that everybody joins the political party that they wish to for whatever reason, that's personal to you. But I also suggest, Rudy, that Pride TT yes. comes up with a letter so that people can say, I am LGBTQ plus and a member of PNM, ONR, ANR, UNC. Right. How many parties are there now? I don't know who it is. Over 20. And I do, <laughs> oh, exactly, I've, I've lost count. <laughs> so if we do a stock letter that right. people can sign and then email to their member of parliament and to their political party that they are a member of. They have to listen to us. Let me tell you something, Trinidad and Tobago. We are 7% of the population. The Muslim community is 7% of the population. So we are equal to the Muslim community. And the Muslim community have holidays, they have rights, they are respected. What do we have?
No, I we're in alignment, Jason, because the first suggestion, that's exactly what the empowerment manifesto is going to be. But yes, to your other two suggestions, we'll take them on board and we can even share that with, you know, we can do it jointly. It doesn't even have to come under our logo. It will come under everybody, yours as well. And let people sign up the damn thing and send it forward. So yeah, I'm, 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 we'll do that. We'll work with you on that. And um, just to encourage people, uh, Jason, I want to, you know, they go say we're going to fight now, right? You tell me we didn't say, you tell everybody we didn't tell you thanks. You know, I we organized that party for you and Peter the at Black Box, eh? Before there was even prior. I, 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 no, no, no. You didn't organize it. I organized it. I spoke to, to Black Box and said, let's have it. And, you know, so no, no, no. The, the impetus was me. And let me also add, you bought a gift for Peter, which he was yes. hugely grateful of and hangs in his house today. And... Uh, me and get nothing. I suck salt. Very well. But we do we do acknowledge you every year. As a matter of fact, you know that all, all I'm saying, listen, Rudy, all I'm saying is it would be very nice for me. Listen, I, I could show you all a little sh I mean, I live in a, a, a shoebox, you know. I I've spent everything and sacrificed everything for this work. It would just be very nice that if Peter Laverick, who deserved that, that honor that night, it would have been very nice to have recognized me as well. And I wasn't. Fair enough. But there's one, there's one thing I will not tell you tonight. That I will, we will have this conversation again, I'm sure, in a few days. But don't worry. You, you will get what is coming to you. Trust me. Trust me. Listen, the last time a man said, I'll get what's coming oh, to you, it ended Jason, up very badly. <laughs> that's, a, that's the other conversation. That's the other, the other live chat. So, you know, guys, on that note, you see, you see how easy it is for people to have discourse and, and not, you know, not fall out about it. We can move forward and get things done. But, Jason, I really want to... Um, thank all of our participants who came on the call and really you know took their time to be with us and remind you guys actually tomorrow night um i believe amanda works with you right amanda mcintyre she's on the call um yes yes amanda is going to be one of the panelists on our live chat that deals with black queer femme activism tomorrow and uh we we're looking forward to that. So I encourage people to come on. As you see, tonight was very beneficial. And I want to start our thanks to you tonight, Jason, by saying it verbally. And I, I, I know more is going to come, but thank you very much for agreeing to do this and for taking, look at the time. You know, it, people have to show up. And, it, you know, people say, oh, well, you know, we only, but yes, you, you could be doing other things right now. You could be doing your work. You could be resting, you know, tending to yourself. And you agreed wholeheartedly. You didn't even, there was no reluctance on your part. And as the commentary shows, if not for us, for the people on the call, it made a huge difference and a great value. And you were very open. You shared with us, uh, you, you became emotional. And I think that genuineness, is what people need to see and experience so that they too can find their way to that part. So thank you very much on behalf of the entire Pride TT community in Trinidad and Tobago. And we look forward to working with you as we move forward, as you said, in one agenda and to achieve, you know, really saving lives and making a difference. So thank you very much. And um, we, we, will, uh, we will load the recording up and send it to you so you can share it with your friends and your supporters. And we look forward to you coming to Trinidad and Tobago soon when the borders reopen, etc. And who knows what might be waiting for you at that time. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Take care of yourself. That sounds like a, that sounds like a threat. <laughs> well, I won't tell people whether you're into um, S&M or not, but... Well, you know... But I in for a penny, in for a in pound. For a pound. <laughs> no, but it was a lovely conversation and we'll do it again. We'll have many more and we take you up on all the suggestions. Let's have the discussions after 
and let's work together because we are about collaboration. We don't want to compete with anybody. We just want to provide a platform and to support your work as you go forward. So thanks again. And, and let me just reiterate, if anyone wants to contact me, I'm going to put my email on the chat box. Actually, I'll tell you now, it's, it's simple. Just, you know, Jason Jones, Esquire at gmail.com. You know, please just, just reach out to me. Just send me a messenger on Facebook. Send me, you know, pigeon, whatever route you can find. I am open to all conversations and to all people. So please don't be afraid. Just send me the message. There's always a way to find me. All of my channels are open and I would love to hear from all of you. I do this work. I'm going to cry. <laughs> I do this work for my ancestors and for you, nobody else. Thank you so much for giving me this space tonight. And congratulations and happy Pride TT. Thank you very much. Take care of yourself and we'll be in touch. Thank you everyone, be safe. And we will all share all the information. Take care, Ella. Yes, you wave that flag, wave that flag. Thank you for being with us in spirit and take care everyone. L much love. Happy Pride.